Um, okay, so hi everyone, welcome. Um, my name is Carlin Leozia, and I um, am on the faculty at OMA and um, help coordinate this workshop series, um, along with Amy Starczewski, who some of you might be able to see in your grid. Um, we'll have the floor later on. <laughs> welcome to Changing the Narrative on Gun Violence. Survivors want you to sit down and listen. The second event um, in the spring season of our year-long oral history workshop series, Oral History and Power. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, I've been thinking a lot lately about this thing that my mom and I say uh, that came from an announcer at the Tour de France who said that good things happen slow and bad things happen fast. Um, and it's about like standings in the race versus crashes in the peloton. Um, and we talk about it a lot because we both play a lot of sports and have our occasional crashes and injuries. Um, but I've also been sort of thinking of this corollary uh, to do with harm and care and how in our day-to-day -day lives, um, they happen at such different paces, harm and care. Like harm seems to happen really, really fast a lot of the time, um, but care is something that takes a long time often. Um, and an example of that that I want to name and hold myself accountable to is that last week uh, at our event here, I was in a rush and I mispronounced uh, the name of the tribe, the Haudenosaunee, whose Thanksgiving address I shared with the group as a way to center us in the space. Um, and I didn't know in the speed of the moment how to provide care without causing harm. Um, and I just, I have to name that that's something I'm still thinking about and working on and it's painfully slow. Um, and on the structural, I've also been thinking about how on the structural level, um, harm can happen really gradually and across long periods of time. And many of the events this year in the series have been about kind of examining that structural slow level of harm um, and exercising long-term care to heal. Um, and Holly's work holds both scales and paces of harm, I think. And I think that by being here tonight for this event and this conversation that we're each participating in an essential act of that kind of long-term slow care. Um, but I also wanted to pause together to practice uh, just a moment of the sort of rare immediate form of care that I always find myself forgetting. Um, so just, I'm, I'm wondering if you'll join me in taking three deep breaths um, at your own pace. Thank you. Uh, this is so strange because still nobody's moving on my screen. So maybe I'm just having a conversation with myself and like yeah, yeah. the satellite in space, but okay. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Um, thank you all for, for joining in that. Um, I also wanted to share, because I forgot about this last week, but uh, this series is made possible in part by the Paul F. Lazarsfeld uh, Fund and we are very grateful for that support. Um, and this particular event is also our annual Brodsky lecture. Um, and so now I want to turn it over to, to Amy Starczewski, the director of OMA, um, Holly's OMA advisor and the administrator of the Brodsky Award uh, to contextualize what that means and to introduce our guest this evening. Amy, you want to take it away? Yeah, thank you, Carlin. Um, and thank you for that lovely introduction and welcome everyone. Um, tonight is a really special evening because we have an Alma alum back with us. We have several of her narrators generously sharing their time with us to talk about this work. And it also, as Carla mentioned, is our annual Brodsky lecture. So since 2015, um, uh, through the generosity of Alma alum Jeff Brodsky and his family, the Jeffrey H. Brodsky Oral History Award has been given to one student annually based on their thesis or capstone work. 
um, who makes what we feel is an important contribution to knowledge and especially a work that really most exemplifies the rigor, the creativity and the ethical integrity that Alma teaches to its students and that we want to see in the field of oral history. And Holly Werner Thomas's uh, 2020 capstone was our winner. Um, we chose this work because it, we felt that it really demonstrates the potential of combining art, oral history, and activism to contribute to critical public political discussions of our time, uh, really in the tradition that Jeff Brodsky established through his uh, OMA master's thesis. And so I want you to uh, join me in congratulating Holly um, and in thanking the Brodsky family for supporting this award. I also have the pleasure of introducing Holly, uh, who is, I have to say, I think one of the most hardworking students, and we've got some hardworking students in this program um, that I have ever encountered, and she's worked tremendously hard on this, on this project and brings a real spirit of, of care and rigor and, um, and strength, I would say, to all of the work that she does. Um, she's a writer and an oral historian uh, whose practice is grounded in historical scholarship and current events. She also has a background in public history. Um, she is helping, I want to let you all know, to organize a symposium that asks, is oral history white? Um, which I think is a really important and, and difficult question for us to think about in the field right now. Um, that grew out of an oral history association panel at the conference last year, one that everyone was talking about, um, that investigated race in three Baltimore oral history projects. And she was one of the presenters in that panel. She's also worked as an oral historian for the Hurricane Katrina oral history project in conjunction with the University of Southern Mississippi, as well as for the National Building Museum in Washington, DC. And she is currently visiting oral history consultant for History Associates, Inc., leading projects for the Pew Charitable Trust and the Lemelson MIT program. Um, so now that we know a little bit more about Holly and her work, um, please join me in welcoming her. And I'll hand it over to you, Holly, to, to take it from here. Thank you so much for sharing this work with us. Thank you so much, both of you, Carly and Amy. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really am honored and I appreciate it. And thank you everybody for being here. So what I wanna to do to begin is just give you a bit of an overview for this evening, because we do have a lot of component parts. So I'm gonna start with a presentation. And in that presentation, I'm going to briefly discuss, you know, my project, the 40% project, the oral history on gun violence, give you a little bit of background on that. I'm going to give you a little contextual information on the issue of gun violence in general with some statistics. I'm also going to present some findings based on the interviews that I've conducted, findings that I don't really see out there um, reported on very much. So, you know, I think that that is, um, goes to the strength of oral history as a methodology itself. And then I'm going to discuss very briefly my play, The Survivors, even why I wrote it. And then we'll segue into a 10 minute reading of the play. And it's after that that we'll conduct the 10 minute, I'm sorry, not the 10 minute, the um, five to six minute each uh, public interviews with the four survivors I've invited here tonight to speak. And I'm just gonna say who they are now and say hello, but I want you to know that I'll be introducing them more thoroughly, of course, uh, as, the, as the time um, is appropriate. So that's Kate Ranta and Kenny Barnes, Kenny Barnes Sr and Betsy Dale Adams and Queen Affie Gaston. And also this evening, we have other survivors who I think are here. Some of them I've seen in uh, the participant list and I just wanna acknowledge them. I'm not sure, they've all told me that they're coming, but I wanna make sure to say hello. So we have Rachel Joseph who might be here from Minneapolis, Deborah Parker from Arizona, Kareem Nelson from New York City, Lachea Cretan who's living in California, but from Louisiana, Elizabeth Partoyan, and Lizette Johnson, I saw you out there. Um, so thank you all for being here. So all of this will be followed by a Q&A and, and you're all welcome to join in. Uh, the survivors who I'm going to be speaking to tonight have all told me that they're very happy to participate in the Q&A. So hopefully that will be a robust discussion. So I want to begin by asking you a question, but rather than answering the question now, hold on to it. I'm gonna put it out there. And when we come back to the Q&A, we can discuss it because I'm really curious about what brought you here tonight and whether or not you have been directly impacted by gun violence yourselves in your lives. So hang on to that for the very end. Um, so now I'm going to be putting up my presentation. Now? Yes. Okay, great. 
Okay, so here we begin. So a little bit about the project. So the 40% project, as you can see, is an oral history of gun violence in America. And it documents the stories, the stories of gun violence survivors. That means both people who have survived being shot and those who have lost loved ones to gun violence. Why do I call it the 40% project? Because 40% refers to the fact that at least 40% of Americans will either be shot or know someone who has been shot in their lifetime. So really an enormous number. More recently, I have actually heard that that's more like 43%. Uh, so really quite extraordinary. Um, the oral histories in the 40% project include people from New York City, suburban Florida, rural Louisiana, sprawling Phoenix, Arizona, small town Washington State, Minneapolis, and other places. They include women and men, sons, fathers, wives, girlfriends, young single men, divorced middle-aged women, widows, nieces, mothers, and friends. They are African-American, white, and biracial, although neither to date Latinx, Native American immigrant or other groups, but that's to date so far, hopefully that will change. All our life story interviews, and I focus on what the survivors, where the survivors are from, their sense of place and home, their families, the gun violence itself, and the aftermath. That aftermath is mostly invisible and includes everything from drawn out legal battles to lost earnings to lifelong medical and psychological complications. Gun violence survivors also experience the feeling of being left behind in a culture that simply moves on and by laws that failed to protect them. In total, about 117,000 Americans are shot on average every single year. That breaks down into about 40,000 people who are killed or take their own lives with a gun and another 77,000 who are injured. This means that every day, 316 people are shot in the United States. Among those, 106 people are killed, 210 survive their injuries, and 22 are children from one to 17 years old, which is about 8,000 children a year who are shot in the United States. I also really just briefly wanna mention the year 2020, which is extraordinary for a lot of reasons, as we all know. Both homicides and gun sales spiked in 2020 to an incredible degree. Nearly 40 million guns were purchased legally in 2020 and another 4.1 million bought just this January. Now, just to put that in context, the year 2006, 10 million guns were sold and that's when the gun sales, gun sales were on, increasing in the United States. 10 years later, 2016, 25 million guns were sold. So now look at 2020, 40 million. And we're, on, on, uh, we're set to be at about 50 million, it's predicted that 50 million guns will be sold legally in the United States this year, an enormous number. At the same time, for very complex reasons that people don't quite understand yet because these numbers started to increase before the lockdown caused by the pandemic, homicides in 2020 increased 21% nationally. And as you can see from the screen, previously the largest recorded one year rise in murders in US history was 12.7%. And that was in 1968, so a long time ago. And also, it's important to note that yes, Chicago and New York City are in the news for the increases, but it's also true that small cities such as Lubbock, Texas, if I have the pronunciation right, Shreveport, Louisiana also experienced um, increases more than they've seen in decades. So the reasons behind 2020's escalation, as I say, are complex, as are the reasons for any type of gun violence more generally. In fact, for a long time, the differences between the people and their stories combined with the complexities of the issues around gun violence really stymied me regarding my own oral history project. Because unlike many oral history subjects, gun violence is not finite, but ongoing. It's not localized, but not national. It doesn't represent one event, but hundreds of events, for lack of a better word, every single day. And so I wondered, what does domestic violence have to do with poverty related violence have to do with suicide? I finally decided that access to guns and the ensuing violence and trauma were the common denominators that mattered most. And I want to note here also that while I am collecting stories from people who describe their lived experiences of a certain time and place, those experiences are not exactly past. What I have found is that the aftermath is ongoing and permanent. Finally, I want to mention that the logistical challenges challenges of a national oral history project on gun violence are also its strengths. Stark themes and broad patterns across the interviews revealed themselves almost immediately. 
and in ways that if I were focused on one type of gun violence, for example, suicide, or one location or one incident, even a mass shooting in which several people were killed, I would not have been able to see these bigger patterns. And I'm going to discuss these now. So here are some of my findings. I'm gonna go through these one at a time. As you can see, starting with the second amendment and gun ownership. So sitting down with people has given me the opportunity to ask some basic questions. You know, How do you feel about the second amendment and whether or not it's ever mattered to you? Have you ever owned guns? If so, what kind? that kind of thing. So one might think that the people being shot and wounded or killed are the ones most loyal to the Second Amendment and they're the ones that have the guns. So I'm asking people these questions that I just mentioned. And so far, the Second Amendment is not relevant to anybody I've spoken to. And I think that's quite astonishing considering the rhetoric, rhetoric that we hear about the Second Amendment. And this includes even people who grew up around guns. Similarly, with gun ownership, everyone from Kareem Nelson, a New York City kid whose mother would not have allowed a gun in the house, he said, but who was exposed to so many guns from such a young age, he could not remember the first time that he saw one, to Kim Russell, who grew up in rural Georgia with a father who had rifles in a display case and a revolver in the bedroom uh, drawer, bedside drawer, told me that there was never any discussion about guns. At most, as with Kim Russell's upbringing, the idea of guns for self-protection was implied. Certainly, there was no discussion about safety or responsibility, much less so-called rights. Importantly, the myth that guns are needed for self-protection is deep-seated, as you can see from the stats I put up on the screen. So we see here an example of the difference between myth and reality. And you know, we're talking about you know, oral history and power in this workshop series, and you can talk about political power, and that's one example as we go through and you want you think about political power with regard to gun violence survivors, policy makers and weapons manufacturers, but there are other kinds of power being described here as well. One is the power of disinformation. But in any case, what does it mean that few Americans, including gun owners, grow up thinking about the Second Amendment? That African Americans don't consider it relevant to their lives at all? What better indicator of the racial divide in our country than the fact that the very people who are disproportionately affected by gun violence, African Americans, are those who feel that gun rights don't apply to them? Like self-protection, another myth that drives policy and sales is the myth of the good guy with the gun. So you've probably heard this before, the, good, the only thing that stops a, a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun, first enunciated by NRA President Wayne LaPierre in 2012 after the massacre of the children in Newtown, Connecticut. However, and perhaps not surprisingly, but still it's quite remarkable when you hear people's stories, how gun violence unfolds in real life is complete bedlam. So a few examples from my interviews. Again, Kareem Nelson. Kareem Nelson had a handgun near him when he was shot in the back in Baltimore and paralyzed. He has never identified his assailant. Rachel Joseph's Aunt Shelley was not only in a courthouse in downtown Minneapolis when she was shot, she had hired an armed security guard to protect her from the very person who killed her. The frightened guard ran away and Shelley was shot four times in the bathroom and died soon thereafter. And Kate Ranta, who's here tonight, during her nearly fatal domestic violence dispute, armed police with bulletproof vests surrounded her apartment in Florida where she was living at the time, but then asked Kate, her father, and their four-year-old son, Kate's four-year-old son, to come out. Her armed ex-husband was still inside with them, although both Kate and her father were severely injured. The police, again, who were armed and had bulletproof vests, did not enter the house and did not prevent the shooting. As Kate said, it's not like the movies. The stories of Betsy Dale Adams, and Betsy's here tonight, Rachel Joseph and Kate Ranta also expose legal loopholes that allow dangerous people to obtain weapons legally. Not even accounting for the illegal gun market because here I'm talking about legal loopholes. I'm going to use Rachel Joseph's story to stay with it as an example. We'll hear from other examples tonight as we go through the evening. So Rachel Joseph's Aunt Shelley, this is in Minneapolis, was killed by a very distant relative who Rachel told me had a lifelong history of harassment to others so severe that she had been banned from a local McDonald's and a post office among other places. She had threatened and harassed Shelly for years before buying a five shot, shirt, five shot 38 at a gun show in a private sale for $60 with no background check and no paperwork, which is legal in Minnesota. This is why I have this, um, this idea of, of 
laws and the laws enabling the gun violence on the screen. So I'm going to explain that. So we hear the, the phrase easy access to guns a lot, but what I am finding when I talk to people that, yes, that's true, but it doesn't go far enough in describing the behavior. The truth is that the laws are not only weak, but enabling, perhaps even incentivizing because people are not being held accountable. In a more rational world, in Aunt Shelley's case, her murderer would not have been allowed to buy a gun. A simple background check or ERPO, which is an extreme risk protection order, could have saved her life. But the seller at the gun show who sold the gun to Aunt Shelley's murderer could, could also have been charged with, say, involuntary manslaughter or criminal, criminally negligent homicide. Put another way, the gun show dealer was incentivized to sell a dangerous person a gun because there are no laws in place to hold him personally accountable. His focus was only on profit. This leads me to another finding, which is that survivors have little to no legal redress. And this is something that we're going to hear a lot more about in our public interviews this evening. But I wanted to mention one example from the federal level. Again, the families of, uh, in Newtown, the families of nine Sandy Hook elementary school victims who were killed in December, 2012, filed a lawsuit in 2015 against Remington, the parent company of Bushmaster and manufacturer of the Bushmaster rifle, which the killer used to massacre the children and teachers. In filing suit, the Sandy Hook families argued that Remington knowingly marketed a military we weapon, the AR-15, to civilians, but the lawsuit was dismissed under a 2005 federal law that gave gun manufacturers broad immunity from liability. This is known as the PLCAA, and it prevents firearms manufacturers, as well as licensed gun dealers, by the way, from being held liable for negligence when crimes have been committed with their products. Wayne LaPierre thanked President George W. Bush at the time for signing what he called the most significant piece of pro-gun legislation in 20 years into law. So just for a minute, just take a moment and compare this now with, say, paint manufacturers who can be held liable for harms caused by lead paint or tobacco companies that can be held liable for tobacco related diseases, or today increasingly pharmaceutical companies that are being held liable for their role in the opioid epidemic um, under state public nuisance laws. But the gun industry remains protected. And then finally, my last finding is something I call the truer cost of gun violence. So Mother Jones Magazine did an investigation into what it called the true cost of gun violence in 2015 which it estimated at $229 billion a year in both direct and indirect costs. Direct costs being things like emergency uh, prisons and courts and indirect costs being everything from lost wages and productivity to lost quality of life. So $229 billion a year. What do I mean by the truer cost of gun violence? So in my interviews, as I'm talking to family members who have lost loved ones, so not only people who have been shot themselves, but family members who have lost loved ones. What I'm finding and what I'm arguing here is that number is, is, is probably substantially more. And it's and because if we include the circle of family and friends around those who've been shot, we'll see that the healthcare costs only grow. For example, consider Deborah Parker's story. She told me when we uh, spoke a few years ago that she had not slept in 11 years and that she had PTSD. She hadn't slept in 11 years since her daughter was murdered, um, not one night. And she has, like I said, PTSD problems for which she has received medical attention. Yet Deborah, Deborah does not register in the healthcare system as a victim or survivor of gun violence, okay? So that's just an overview of the issue, my project and some of the findings based on the interviews. Um, so before we turn to the reading and the public interviews, I wanted to talk a little bit about my play, its structure and why I even decided to write it. So for those of you who are non-oral historians out there, and I hope that there are some, um, the idea of an oral history project in a traditional way, and this is where this started for me, is really one where you're collecting stories because they're worth collecting, usually around a theme. It could be a neighborhood oral history project or it could be Hurricane Katrina, but there's a theme. You collect the stories, you find an archive to preserve the stories in. And I still think that that's important and very gratified that the Columbia Archives is in fact going to be doing that with this project. However, However, using oral history as a tool for social change was almost instinctive for me with this project. Activist oral, activist oral history was something I didn't know I was really doing until I started to, to get more into uh, the oral histories themselves. In other words, 
I knew that I wanted to be a part of a campaign, an activist campaign and affect change. I didn't know how to go about that as an oral historian. And I didn't really have the words for that until a few years ago with the help of Amy Starczewski, in fact, and Oma. But in any case, activist oral history has social transformation as its explicit and ultimate aim. What is my aim with this project and in general around the issue of gun violence? In fact, it's to live in a country free from gun violence, which is a pretty big goal. Um, I think it's achievable. How do you get there? How do you achieve that end? And especially as an oral historian, the testimony from these oral histories and the resulting findings could be used as evidence before lawmakers or quoted in a newspaper article or an academic journal, say on public health. The survivors, in fact, do this themselves as activists when they put their stories forward. But I also wanted to create something that would potentially reach wider audiences and maybe even create the kind of empathy that can result in positive cultural and political change. In other words, to harness the power of narrative. Telling one's true story is a kind of reclamation. And as we have seen, stories also challenge dominant narratives, for example, about the myths about the good guys with a gun or self-protection or one we haven't talked about, which is personal responsibility. Challenging these dominant narratives is important because we are very much influ influenced, all of us, by the beliefs of those around us. We were even pushed along in our cognitive bias because it's safe and gives us a sense of community and belonging. How do we challenge that? How do we penetrate those walls? Truly, if we want to take in new information, narrative is necessary. I mean, think about it. If facts were enough, we probably wouldn't be in this position. You heard some of the statistics this evening, right? So narrative is necessary. Stories are also remembered 22 times more than facts. But how do we deliver those stories? Oral historians don't always think of the theater as an outlet for their work. So on the screen, I have an example of a documentary theater piece, a very famous one called The Laramie Project. And I'm sure many of you have seen or heard of this play. Playwright and theater director Moises Kaufman has said that the idea for the Laramie Project originated in his desire to understand, the, to understand Matthew Shepard's murder, why it happened in Laramie and how Laramie is both different from and similar to anywhere else in America. And just briefly, if you don't know, Matthew Shepard was a young gay college student in Laramie, Wyoming when he was brutally murdered in the late 1990s. So in other words, the Tectonic Theater Project's efforts began as an effort to understand what happened. The activism was instinctive and the result was a work of art. In watching the Laramie Project and other works of verbatim theater, I realized that the immediacy of the spoken word and the occasion for deep listening, two goals oral, history, oral historians strive for are abundant in theater. For activists, oral historians focused on current events or the recent past who desire to spark dialogue or to promote social change, documentary theater also represents a remarkable opportunity to reach people. And so my play, a little bit of an introduction before we head to the reading. So my play, The Survivors, begins with a sense of place. And I hope that the piece is stronger for it because beginning there helps to reveal the ubiquity of guns in America. It also pays homage to the life story interview and shows the ultimate displacement of survivors and what they have lost as they strive to piece together their lives in the aftermath of the trauma. My focus is on voice and the juxtaposition of experiences. And I allow the interview excerpts to dismantle the, count, I'm sorry, the counter arguments of the pro-gun lobby without my having to explicitly state them. So act one, American dreaming. This is where people talk about their homes and their families, where they grew up. And it segues into conversation about whether they grew up with guns and how they feel about the second amendment. Act two, A Place Like No Other, documents everyone's stories the day of the shootings, either what happened to them directly or where they were and how they found out about their loved ones. And in act three, Fly Away, the aftermath of the violence is showcased. So that includes everything from people's health, and that can be emotional, physical, and psychological, the financial after aftermath, the funerals, and the trials. Okay, so here I'm going to escape out and hand it to Carlin for the 10 minute reading. Sure, thanks Holly. I'm just gonna keep my video off to see about the internet hiccuping. Um, 
So we have some volunteers from our Orthos Street workshop class um, who are gonna read and they'll keep their cameras off. Um, and I forget if I mentioned this to that group before, but just um, to read the, the name of the part you're reading for at the beginning of each line. Holly, am I getting all that? Okay, we've got the thumbs up. Um, so Rachana, if you wanna start it off. Thank you all. <clears throat> Kim Russell. Philip and I had dinner and I don't remember the name of the restaurant. Can't remember for the life of me, but it was a fairly new restaurant in East Atlanta and it was Italian and it was really good. In Columbine, it just happened like four days before we were out on this date. And so we ended up talking a lot about Columbine. And I remember Philip just being really freaked out. You know, I mean, he was like, Kim, what if, what if I have students like that in my class and I don't recognize that they could do that? What if, what if I can't protect my students? You know, how, how did that happen? You know, it was just, it was incomprehensible at the time what had happened. And, you know, we just remember seeing the footage. They just played it over and over again of the kids leaving the school and kids dangling from the windows. And it was just awful. Chris Boehner. After she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, she somehow, and I found this going through her papers afterwards, she somehow managed to acquire three concealed carry permits from Montana, Alabama, and Florida. Kim Russell. The warehouse party was in this part of town where um, this beautiful old Victorian neighborhood in Atlanta called Inman Park. Chris Boehner. She owned guns that she bought at gun stores. How did this happen? I would have really appreciated it if no one sold my daughter a gun. Kim Russell. Inman Park kind of meets with, um, sort of meets with Cabbage Town and this other big road that goes into downtown. So it's just sort of this, this mix where these different neighborhoods are intersecting. You've got a lot of money here. Like at the time the mayor lived in Inman Park, that neighborhood. And then over here, you've got a, a more rundown neighborhood that was starting to get gentrified by artists. And, um, but still, you know, you had to be careful. Um, so this party was right where all of those things sort of met. Kenny Barnes. When my son was murdered, I owned a four bedroom home right in the corner of I-95 on Conti Road. Do you know where that is? The corner house right there. I own that house. Uh, it was, it's a beautiful home. It's in a cul-de-sac as you come into this private community. Beautiful home, three bedrooms in a full basement, three levels, acre of land, just absolutely gorgeous home. Deborah Parker. And Lindsay decided to send some text messages. So she was sitting on the front porch with her cell phone, sitting on one of those old green plastic chairs that so many people had on their porch back then. Judy Richardson. We were so hopeful when we learned that the police had the weapon used to shoot our daughter, hopeful that the person responsible was off the street and would be brought to justice. Rachel Joseph, about two months before Susan shot Shelly and Rick, she went to a gun show and she bought an antique gun, like a five shot 38 through a private sale for $60 with no background check, no paperwork. I didn't know until the trial that that type of gun sale is completely legal in Minnesota. I think she went to buy a gun through a private sale specifically because she thought she would, wouldn't pass the background check due to her history, her harassment history. And I don't know if she would have or not, but I know that she probably thought she wouldn't. So that's why she bought the gun the way she did. And then she, we, we learned during the trial that she went through target shooting and learned how to use it practiced. Judy Richardson. Imagine how frustrating it was to learn that the police could not trace the gun because the owner sold it without keeping records of who bought it. This weapon was originally bought legally and later sold at a gun show through the so-called gun show loophole and the person who sold this weapon at the main gun show asked no questions, kept no records, and claims he can't remember who he sold the weapon to. 
I don't understand that you sell a weapon, you can't remember anything. Kim Russell. I was afraid that if we got to the warehouse party, I didn't know if they would have bathrooms or if they would have porta potties or if there would be a million people waiting. But in Georgia, you know, when you have to pee, you squat in the woods. You know, I'm not above that. So he was like, I do too. I was like, well, we should just kind of go here. I was embarrassed, but he seemed okay. So he was like, okay, I'll go this way. I was like, okay, and I'll go that way. Kenny Barnes, a tornado was going through the heart of DC. You know, it had come through downtown and come up through Route 1. And so I had a friend of mine with me and the tornado was coming up Route 1 and we're trying to, to run away from the tornado and get away from the tornado to get to my house. Rachel Joseph, the week before Shelly had and found another dead cat in her front yard and she thought she had seen Susan in her neighborhood, which, you know, Susan lived in St. Paul, a good 40 minutes from where Shelly lived. And she was really scared that day. Kate Branta. I was also fighting for a permanent restraining order. The judge extended it, didn't make it permanent. He just extended the temporary for another few months. I asked for a permanent restraining order because Tom had violated it many, many times. He sent a package of creepy cards, like obsessive. Um, he created a fake Facebook account and tried to talk to me that way. He emailed me, he emailed the president, the CEO, and the vice president of United Healthcare, which was my employer, and said that they had a rogue employee who's sleeping and drinking on the job. He vandalized my car, my dad's car, one of the apartments I had moved into, he broke into, into and drew a penis on the wall of William's room in like a black light marker, so it would show up at night. Deborah Parker. The first house party they went to was kind of boring. Nothing was going on, so they went around the corner to another party, and it was at a house where they knew the person that lived there from high school. So it was an acquaintance, not a good friend, but somebody they were familiar with. And this house was lit up with beautiful white twinkling Christmas lights because we went there to look at it afterwards. So it looked so friendly with these Christmas lights twinkling. And the night she was there, there was music playing. Quite a few young adults having fun, talking. Betsy Dale Adams. They all met at the, basically the only club in the town and that was at the Holiday Inn out by the interstate, out by I-65. I worked at that restaurant when I was 16, 17 years old. I worked as a waitress at that restaurant. But anyway, there was a lounge and there was like a little boom chi chi band that would play there or sometimes just good music. And all of my old friends and Pat's friends would meet out there and just, you know, have a good time. And that's where they met. I was down in Fort Walton with my husband that night. Daddy and Joyce, my parents had gone to the boat. They sailed the whole weekend on Pensacola Bay. Kenny Barnes. So we get into my house and the first call I get is from my sister. And my sister called me and said, you know, Kenny's been shot. Now, the first thought that came to my mind, I remember distinctly, you know, he probably got shot in the arm or something. and. We're going to be laughing and joking about uh, this one day. That was the first thought that came to my mind. Kimberly Gatbunton. So I pick up the phone and it's the hospital saying your son's been shot. And right away, I didn't quite panic because I thought like paintballing or something. I mean, this is my kid. He's six foot three. He's indestructible. I mean, he ran a race without a shoe. Kenny Barnes, Sr. But then his wife called me and told me that he'd been killed. Kim Russell. Um, and then this is where the order, sometimes I can't quite remember the order. If he yelled first or if I heard the pop first, I don't really know, but I was just kind of getting myself situated, but I was still squatting. And then I heard Philip yell and I heard pops, but I don't know what he said, but I remember it took me a second and I thought, well, that's not a firecracker. That's not a firecracker. Oh my God, he's, he's, he's warning me. That's a warning yell. Even though I didn't know what he was yelling 
and I panicked. And I remember it almost seems like time slowed down as I was figuring all of this out in my head. Deborah Parker, and unbeknownst to Lindsay, there were some gang members that lived in this neighborhood and five of them sat in a car down the street at the stop signs with their lights off, waiting for just the right moment. Betsy Dale Adams. Pat's friends waited at the bar, at the club, and they waited and waited, and Pat never came back. So they said, well, I don't know where he is, but we're going to go home now, and we'll meet in the morning, just like we had previously planned. And the next morning, he never showed up at where they were going to meet. And they went on to Waterworld, and that was Saturday. This was Father's Day, 1995. Chris Boehner. Julie was 29 when she died, last May 9th, of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. She was my baby, the youngest child. And on Mother's Day last year, we had the private family viewing. That was the very last time I saw my daughter. So naturally, this Mother's Day was absolutely fraught with pain and suffering for me. Deborah Parker. And I don't know what that moment was that they proceeded to come down the street slowly. There were five men in the car and as they drove by the house, five of them opened fire on the house. One of the weapons they used was an AR-15. Betsy Dale Adams. Then that Wednesday, I was barely able to work. You have to feel this to understand what it's really like to lose a loved one missing. Um, words can't describe what it feels like. Kate Branta. I mean, it was constant stalking and harassing and scary behavior and nobody ever, ever did anything about it, ever. Kenny Barnes. So we had to go by the hospital and we had to view he was at the hospital now. And so I had to, he was, he was there. I will never forget. He was lying on the, on a gurney. Right. And, you know, I'm just, I got so upset. They had to admit me. I had an asthma attack and they had to admit me and take care of me. But anyway, a minister came in there and I never will forget the minister coming in there and telling me, you know, you got to turn this over to Jesus. Kim Russell. So then I started running around this old truck and I was shielding my face and I was yelling, I don't see you, I don't see you. Please don't shoot me, I don't see you, don't shoot me. And the whole time I'm running, he's shooting at me. I got shot. I was still conscious, I hit the floor. I'm Russell. So I ran around this truck and then I started to get under the truck because I didn't have anywhere else to go. And then I heard him coming and I thought, well, he's been shooting at me so I could be dead. I'm going to play dead. And half my legs were under the truck and the rest of me was, was just in a lot, the parking lot. So I'm trying to play dead, but my heart was just beating out of my chest. And I remember thinking he's going to know I'm not dead. And then, so I had my eyes closed because I was still convinced that if I saw him, that, you know, that was it. So with my eyes closed, I felt the gun on my head. Betsy Dale Adams. And anyway, um, that's when you, you become a different person with worry. You're just like, where is Pat? Where's Pat? And you can't think of anything else. You become a different person. My father on that Tuesday, he came down to my, my place in Fort Walton. We rode out to Robin's house. She had not seen him and my father was just shaking and they were so close. We were all close, but he became, he was just no sleep, pacing. Joy said all he would do is pace all night long. Where's Pat? Where's Pat? Where's my child? Where's my son? We were all just sick and everybody, and then the whole town became sick because it's such a small, close town. And it was all through Evergreen. Where's Pat Dale? Where's Patrick Dale? Thank you very much, everybody, for the reading. Really appreciate it. I hope that that was clear coming through the Zoom. It's a little difficult. Um, that gives you some idea of the play from Act Two. 
Uh, so we're going to move on now to the interviews. And first up is Kate Ranta. You there, Kate? I can't see you. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Okay. Hey there. Hi. Hi. Thanks so much for being here. So I'm going to introduce you first, and then we'll get into the questions that we're going to be discussing. So okay. Kate Ranta is a domestic and gun violence survivor. In November 2012, her estranged husband and Air Force Major appeared at her apartment and shot Kate twice and her father twice in front of her then four-year-old son. Everyone survived. Her attempted murderer was found guilty in 2017 on all five counts against him and sentenced to 60 years in prison. Kate now elevates her story for activism and awareness around violence against women, especially the deadly intersection between abuse and guns. She has been a gun violence prevention activist for several years. She is a speaker and marketing professional and has appeared in documentary films, in national media, and on ex expert panels. She is also the author of the book, Killing Kate, a story of turning abuse and tragedy into transformation and triumph. And Kate is the mother of two boys. And so I know you wanted to focus on the legal system and the systems that failed to protect you and your family and how you did, and people did not take you seriously or believe you about the danger you were in until after your ex-husband shot you and your father. This began the first time you sought a restraining order from Broward County in Florida. So can you tell us what the police said to you when they showed up at your door with this restraining order? Yeah, so I had gone to get a temporary restraining order after what I call the first um, time he attempted to be physical with me. And when I, I got it and gave the paperwork to the police, they said that they this was in Florida, that they could by law go into the house and um, confiscate the guns that we had in the home and, and he had many. Um, so I felt good about that. But then they, like in the very next breath, they said, well, he can just go out tomorrow and get a new gun, just so you know. Um, so it was very, you know, confusing to me, never having been through this, thinking, okay, well, I've done the right thing. I've gotten the restraining order. Now they're going to take the guns. But you're telling me that he can legally go get a new gun the next day. It didn't make any sense. So even though he did have the temporary restraining order against him, um, it was because he wasn't convicted of anything that he would be able to get the guns. So his name wouldn't have hit any of the systems that would have you know, not allowed him to legally buy a gun. So, I mean, it's a giant, giant loophole yeah. um, you know, that we need to close. And it's, it goes to what I was trying to explain in my presentation about how the laws are actually enabling. Right. So this enabling the violence, it's not preventing anything, right? And so you oh, were not- Right, I mean, it, it, it made absolutely no sense to me. And that's just one state, that's just Florida, I mean, state to state it varies so yeah so the, this unwillingness of anyone in the system to listen to you and help continued through your experience with the police the evening that your ex-husband showed up at your apartment with a semi-automatic weapon mm -hmm. can you describe what the police said the evening after you called them because your tires had been slashed Right, so I had discovered that uh, my tire was slashed and I, I knew it was him. I mean, it definitely was him. So um, I called the police, my dad came over, uh, he stayed inside with Will and a cop showed up, a young female cop. And I explained to her the whole situation, the history of what had been going on, that things had been brewing and escalating and culminating that he clearly had stalked me to my new apartment. I had not given him the address and here's a slash tire. Um, I had been, uh, I had sought uh, restraining orders, subsequent restraining orders three different times. I was turned down for all of them. Um, and she said what I knew she was gonna say, which was, well, there's really nothing we can do because you don't have a restraining order and you can't prove it was him, you can't prove it was that he slashed the tire, so there's really nothing I can do. Um, so she said, why don't you go get a restraining order at the courthouse tomorrow? And I said, well, I don't know what good that's gonna do. I've already been turned down for three. Um, you know, so it, it would be a waste of time. Um, but I said to her as she was leaving, 
he's going to have to kill me before you people do anything about him. And then literally um, 20 minutes later, he appeared and, and that's when the shooting happened. But what was so frustrating to me subsequently in putting these things together is that, you know, yeah, she couldn't technically legally do anything about it, but she didn't even ask to see a picture of him. She didn't ask for a description of his car, nothing. Um, and I feel like if she had just done that, had been a little proactive, say, and driven even on the property, she would have seen that he was on the property mm -hmm. and that, you know, it, it was, it was a very preventive measure that it, it was so easy. Um, it's just, I, I just feel like the, 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 you know, they don't take it seriously enough until something actually happens. Right. And you also mentioned she could have, um, you know, giving you a ride to your parents' house. Yeah, anything, <laughs> you know, I, if it, the tire was slashed, I was scared. Mm -hmm. She knew the history. I told her the history. She could have mm -hmm. said, hey, why don't, you know, just for safety, why don't you, why don't to drive you to your parents' house or something, anything, but she didn't do anything. And she was also there that evening after the shooting, wasn't she? She was. Um, she was one of the responding officers. It was like the whole department seemed like they were there. But as when I was laying on the ground, um, I could hear. I subsequently knew, found out it was her, but I knew it was her even in that moment. She was saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and crying over me. Um, and I yelled out, I expletive told you that he was going to do this. I told all of you I was I was so angry. Right. So you also wanted to talk a little bit about the trial and you described it as torture. And um, before you delve into your experience, I wanted to also quote Deborah Parker from Arizona because it's very different from your experience, but equally excruciating. So in Deborah Parker's case, her daughter was murdered in a drive-by shooting very randomly. This is what she had to say. She said, but because it was gang related, nobody would speak up. We went six years without any charges filed, even though everybody knew who did it. The gang members that were charged, their families would come to support them wearing the gang colors and making threatening gestures. When we had people testifying, we had to have some of the people leave because they were threatening the witnesses. It was just horrible. We had to be escorted out with police officers to our vehicles for our own safety. My address was on alert with 911, with a 911 system in case they ever got a call from my house because, I'm um, sorry, from my house that, they're, that they were there to show up with extra officers with SWAT, with whoever they could send because we were at risk for our lives. Okay, so that's one, so that's after six years of waiting for anything with no promise that anything will ever be resolved, at least um, legally in that sense. And so now I want to ask you, you know, you said it took almost five years and that was shocking to you at the outset. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So right after the shooting, uh, my father and I had to meet with a prosecutor in Broward County that was going to be um, taking on our case. And when we met with her, um, she, she was very frank and very real right up front and said that, um, that the case could take a long time to come to trial, but also due to the fact that uh, of the uh, defense attorney that he had hired had a reputation of continuing and, and continuing and continuing and that this could take upwards of four to five years. And my father and I looked at each other and looked at her like, are you crazy? There's no way that this is gonna take that long. And unfortunately she was right. Um, over the course of the four and a half, almost five years, um, our prosecutor turned over like four times. So we had to meet with a different prosecutor every time. Um, and they were all great. Let me just say, I mean, we really, I, I have to say that we were, we were very lucky. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it would be, we'd get a subpoena every so often in the mail, and then there'd be a continuance. And then, we finally went to trial in September of 2016, only to have a mistrial because the jurors didn't follow protocol and had clearly talked amongst themselves and the judge had to call a mistrial. Um, you know, I, I, I missed lots of work because of it. I, um, I mean, the PTSD and the triggering and the re-traumatization each time I had to get, you know, prepare to go through with this. After the September mistrial, 
it would get continued even two more times. We didn't even go to trial until that February of 2017. So I, it was just, we were told from the start that defendants have more rights than victims. We also didn't believe that. And they're absolutely right. The, mm -hmm. the defendant had way more rights than we ever did. Um, mm -hmm. The one thing I will say that they stuck to was that my dad and I were adamant that we were not going to accept any form of plea deal that we wanted to take it and you know to a jury trial, and they respected that. Um, but I mean, just the the ongoing circus is mm -hmm. so awful. You had that hanging over your head with no. Yeah, guarantee. you can't move on. You can't. You cannot move on right. um, in all that time. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your being here. Thank you so much for explaining that to all of us. You're welcome. Thanks. Um, and I hope you can stick around for the Q and A because I'm sure there'll be questions. Yep. So okay. I want to bring on Kenny Barnes. Kenny, are you there? Where did Kenny go? We need to find Kenny and unmute. Yeah, there we go. You there? You got him? I don't see Kenny. <laughs> Zoom, what can you do? I, I see Kenny, but I'm not able to unmute him for some reason. We can come back around if you want to work on it, and then I can go to Betsy. Okay. Kenny, sounds good. I'm I'll sorry, work on that. Hang on, hang on, okay? So, Betsy Dale Adams, are you here? You with us? Are we losing people? I'm right here. Oh, there you are. Okay, great. Okay, so, so glad you're here with us tonight. Betsy, for everybody who doesn't know, is calling in from the Gulf Coast. So one benefit of Zoom, I guess, because there's some drawbacks, obviously, is that we can, we can do this from all these thousands of miles away. So I'm gonna introduce you and then we'll head into the questions, okay? So Betsy Dale Adams is the sister of Patrick Dale, who was murdered in July, 1983 near Evergreen, Alabama, by a stranger he had offered a ride home to outside of a Holiday Inn lounge where Pat had spent the evening with friends. The murderer, Douglas Griffin, had a long history of mental illness and violent behavior, but had been released from a state mental facility just 72 days before. He also had access to his parents' shotgun, which he used to shoot Pat Dale. Pat Dale was two years older than Betsy and was 27 years old when he was killed. He had been working as his father's right-hand man in the family-run truck manufacturing business and was just emerging from the end of a painful divorce. Betsy was born in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1957 and moved to small town Alabama near the Gulf Coast by the time she was nine. She is a retired registered nurse and is an activist with Every Town for Gun Safety Survivor Network and Moms Demand Action. She published a book in 2014 called Immunity from Justice, Pat's Story, which details the events surrounding her brother's murder, her family's struggle in the aftermath of Pat's death, as well as both the criminal trial and the wrongful death civil suit her father filed against the state of Alabama for its negligence in releasing Griffin from a state mental institution. The suit ended in acquittal. So Betsy, can you describe a little bit about what you learned, what your family learned about your brother's murderer during the trial and why your father sued both the Holiday Inn where they had been that evening, as well as the state run psychiatric hospital, Bryce Hospital and three state of Alabama employees who worked there. Uh, yes, I can. And, you know, we learned uh, a lot of the facts, like I hear from other survivors, you learn so much during the trial. The trials are so very painful. Uh, but yeah, Douglas Griffin, the murderer, uh, his past was checkered with troubles with the law throughout his young life, including domestic violence, robbery from his own family, multiple DUIs, multiple times in drug and alcohol rehab, and even holding the same gun on a paraplegic farmer just two weeks of him kidnapping and murdering my brother. He had multiple indictments against him, but they were never carried out. We found out during the civil trial that while this man was in the state-owned mental institution, Bryce Hospital in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Griffin's wife sent them a letter he had sent to her, which he was going to kill himself but was going to kill a lot of other people first. He was discharged almost a month early anyway, even though clear documentation was that he was homicidal. They left him on the alcohol treatment unit, not the psychiatric unit, and not treating him for mental illness, um, 
even though he was psychotic and having hallucinations and delusions. It was stated by his doctors that he was uncooperative in taking up space. 72 days later, he took his parents' loaded shotgun and murdered my brother, but yet he was released early and had full access to a loaded gun. My brother Patrick was being a good Samaritan and gave this guy a ride home that night, <clears throat> only to be kidnapped at gunpoint forced to drive his car into the night with a shotgun pointing at his head and then decapitated at close range only to be eaten by animals and buzzards in the hot sun for the next five days. The civil suit was brought against the Alabama Department of Mental Health, Bryce Hospital, and the doctors and staff that managed his care and released him back into society. He also sued the Holiday Inn for serving alcohol to Griffin when he was clearly intoxicated. We, were, we prevailed with all of these suits. They were all found guilty. The Holiday Inn settled, but the state employees and institutions appealed all the way to the state Supreme Court. After about a two year court battle, it was acquitted due to sovereign immunity of state employees and institutions. This translates to the state fighting for justice of Pat's murder, the state against Douglas Griffin for capital murder. They fought hard and won for Pat. Then the state turned around and fought against Pat's murder to protect their institutions and employees from negligence, even though they were found guilty. They had no defense except that they were not liable for their negligent actions. That is no defense and this is wrong. And, it is, and so is the fact that Griffin got the gun from his parents' home, fully loaded and sitting by behind the door. They were fully aware of their dangerous son. People that own weapons should be held fully accountable for keeping them out of the hands of dangerous people and young children. If this is to become law, I promise you, less people would die from gun, silent, from gun violence. There are some loopholes that need to be closed. With gun ownership, there is a lack of accountability of liability for keeping the weapon out of dangerous hands. Sovereign immunity was not a law intended to protect employees from negligence or wrongful death if found guilty, but it has been twisted for wrong and dangerous reasons. Mental health institutions who are negligent regarding dangerous patients should be held accountable for their actions. In Pat's case, they were complicit in Pat's death. And society has a lackadaisical and willfully ignorant attitude about these problems. In conclusion, my, while my brother's murderer is in prison for life, no other entity was ultimately held accountable for his murder except the Holiday Inn for serving him alcohol while he was intoxicated. And, and just from my previous, uh, the previous uh, survivor, I just have to say that the triggers, uh, the triggers and the uh, PTSD never ends. Um, I'm 63 now, I was 25 when this happened. And anytime I see, uh, <clears throat> when anytime I see buzzards or, or vultures on the side of the road eating roadkill, I go down into a dark, deep, deep tunnel because that's what happened to Pat for five days. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you so much. I just, before introducing Kenny and Queen, I just want to sort of reiterate some of the themes and I hope you're hearing them because I do. See, these are some of the patterns that emerge when you talk to an array of people across the United States by about different gun violence experiences, the lack of accountability, the system failures, not just regarding the gun industry itself, but all the others, all the other systems. Okay, and so that's pertinent to Kenny's story as well. So hopefully Kenny's with us now. Kenny, are you there? So Holly, I was looking through, I think there's not a way to manually unmute Kenny. So he might have to rejoin the meeting for his microphone to turn on. Oh no, that's a bummer because that's gonna be difficult for him. Um, yeah. Do you want to, if you send me his phone number, I can. 
Can you hear me? Kenny, there, there you are. Yes, wonderful. Thank you, oh. I'm so grateful. Okay, you're here, okay. I, I made it, I made it. You're in, okay, good. I'm sorry for the trouble, I'm really sorry. I'm gonna introduce you and then we're gonna go into our interview, okay? Okay. So here we go. Who we are as a country and how that corresponds to the value we place on human life, regardless of the color of our skin is something that Kenny Barnes Sr., who grew up in the Trinidad neighborhood of North in Northeast Washington, DC, in the 1950s when the city was still legally segregated has thought about every day since his only son Kenny Barnes Jr. was murdered in his store in September 2001 by a 17 year old with an illegal gun. Kenny Sr., a former concert promoter and a psychologist has been pushing aggressively for reform since his son was killed. He founded Reaching Out to Others Together, Root Inc. to advocate on behalf of victims of gun violence and their families for which he has received many awards including the National Service Award from Attorney General Eric Holder and the Department of Justice in April 2009 at the National Crime Victims Rights Week Awards ceremony. He has also had two days named in his honor in Washington, DC. Recently, he has helped to develop a collaborative effort between the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives and the Milken School of Public Health at George Washington University to create better communication between the police and minority youth. So Kenny, you have told me that on the one hand, you have been gratified that more people are paying attention to the gun violence crisis and treating gun violence the way you've always described it, which is as a public health issue. But you've also said that you have watched the white gun violence prevention community grow and felt left out of the conversation. Yet black Americans are 10 times more likely than whites to die by gun homicide, according to the CDC. As I quote you in the play, you say, quote, it's not just about mass murders and white people getting killed in America. If you want to talk about that, fine. But if you really want to truly talk about the impact of gun violence, it's far more complicated. Kenny, can you explain that? What do you mean by that? You've talked about two kinds of gun violence in America. Yes. Uh, first of all, when my son first got murdered and I was working on my doctorate, I dropped out of school. So I had no idea about really gun violence. So in my 15, 20 years working at this, I've noticed that there are two types of gun violence taking place in America today. The first kind is what we see on TV all the time, and that's when the Brady Bunch or, or other people be talking about, and that's when a, a deranged white person shoots a lot of white person. It's a mental health issue. We still don't know the reasons why. And, and, and this person uses legal weapons uh, to do his damage. The second kind of gun violence that we find today is what occurs in my community. And that's caused by socioeconomic conditions. And what's used is illegal weapons. And so the concentration by paying attention all the time when you see the news come on is when you see these people talking about gun violence, we talk about the gun violence rules and regulations and, and, and checks and bound up and new regulations. Uh, about ER 15s, which should be reckoning. It really doesn't affect black communities. We get our guns stolen uh, from people and they're sold. So if I'm hearing you correctly, you have, in a sense, different issues. So for example, we've talked about this more than once. You have, you have told me that background checks, obviously we need background checks. And we've talked about yes. assault rifles, yes. obviously military, yes. military style weapons don't belong in civilian society. But yes. those are more white issues than black yes. as, as it pertains to gun violence because in the black community in general, it's handguns and it's the everyday violence and it's, we're talking about illegal guns more than legal yes. guns, correct? Yes, correct. And I'll tell you one other thing too. Mm -hmm. When this white person is shooting people indiscriminately, he's not caring who he kills. Right. When a black person picks up, picks up a gun, he knows who he wants to kill, or he or she knows who he wants to kill. It's not indiscriminate uh, shooting people all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're in that range of fire, you may be collateral damage. But a black person has a specific person that he's trying to kill. So incredibly different issues, really. Yeah. Um, same result, same result. But the fact that they're so different, the causes are so different, are, are not being addressed. What's right. talked about all the time again, is this deranged white person. That's what it is. It's the news. 
And that's what the rules and regulation debate's about. Right. You can go in any town in America, any small town, it don't matter where you are, I mean, any urban city, and you can look at the paper on the news and you'll see that some black person has been shot and been murdered. But we don't hear that on the news. Right. So, Kenny, what are the issues you would like to see focused on? What are the laws that you would like to see changed and that you would that you believe would most impact the black community? Well, first of all, we 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 don't you can't vote, you can't regulate morality. Uh, you can't make it uh, regulate empathy. But our conditions are social economic. And so we are born more or less in violent communities where violence is picked up and violence is a learned behavior. And but one law, if I can have a pass a law, one law that I would really like to pass is that anybody who sells an illegal gun and that person uses that illegal gun in, in a you know homicide or, or violence, that person who sold that gun should be charged with a conspiracy and get the same charge as the person that didn't murder. That's one law that I would like to see. Right. And the other thing that the other thing I would like to see is everything's reaction. You know, you you wait until the reaction when something that happens. And let me tell you from my knowledge, my experience, and my teaching, nobody ever picks up a gun one day and says, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and shoot somebody. Today. That mass murderer doesn't do it, no neither to the black kid on the street. It's there. The signs and symptoms are there. And they're very easily preventable. If people notice it, they come on it and report. Yeah, I agree with that. And Kenny, you've also told me that you've given your life over the past, past 15 or 20 years really to this issue, but you still feel like Don Quixote tilting at windmills. Yeah. In the last minute, can you tell us what you mean by this? Yes. When I first started, you mentioned a statistic earlier about death by gun violence. Mm -hmm. It's the number one murderer, number one killer of African-American males in society today. When my son was murdered, it was still, it was the number one murderer of, of African-Americans, uh, 18 to 35 also. Right, and the almost other thing 20 I, years ago, almost 20 yeah. years ago, yeah. And then one, one other thing I want to bring to mind to give you an example. When I, with my psychological background, when I first started finding out what was going on, I got involved with a class of children who had parents murdered or friends murdered. And they were linked in with children who had disabilities. So they were being considered as being a learning disabled, when in fact, it was just really the trauma that they were going through with gun violence. And we did a survey with children, grades five to 12, in Prince George's County, in DC, and in New Orleans, and we had some four basic questions. Okay, but uh, Kenny, I mean, Kenny, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm going to bring in Queen at this point because we're running out of time. Okay. I okay. Okay. Um, but I, what you're talking about in terms of community trauma is something that Queen is going to talk about as well. And it's super important. And I wish we had a whole evening to discuss just that. Um, Queen, are you there? I want to bring you in now to the discussion as well. I am. Thank okay. you. You've been very patient. Okay. So, Queen, I'm going to introduce you and then we'll go into what we're going to talk about, which you know, which your activism as well. So Queen Affie Gaston was born in 1975 in Washington, D.C. and raised on Rhode Island Avenue in the city alongside her two brothers, Calvin and Chris. Her father was a preacher and her mother a homemaker. Like her mother, Queen got married at 21 and it is, and it is with her ex-husband, Antoine, that she had her daughter, Anana. Do I have that right? Okay, good. Nicknamed Smiley. Smiley was murdered by her boyfriend on July 30th, 2016 in Washington, D.C. with her two-month-old daughter on her lap. She was 19. Although she found some stability at home, Queen has said that the crack epidemic that began in the 1980s when she was a child soon overtook her neighborhood and house quite literally because starting at the age of 11, she watched her parents try to help several boys and young men who had been shot come through their front door. Her best friend was also murdered when he, she was a teenager and like her daughter, she was killed by her young child's father. Queen has, both, has been both a victim and a, of domestic abuse, uh, I'm sorry, 
Queen has been both a victim of domestic violence and an abuser. She began her advocacy work in domestic violence years before her daughter was killed and founded Domestic Violence Wears Many Tags DVMW, I'm sorry, DVWMT in 2008. DVWMT is a Washington DC based domestic violence prevention and resource organization dedicated to restoring and preserving a stable family environment through services, advocacy and education. And so Queen is gonna talk, Kenny had just started to talk about this and I know both Betsy and Kate and many others are activists. They've become activists uh, usually after a shooting but you were already an activist. You were already working on the issue of domestic violence when it found your daughter. So I wanted to bring you in to talk about that. One of the things that you told me that I found really shocking was you said that you were not surprised that your daughter was killed by this young man and that he was more surprised than you are. What did you mean by this? And why do you work with men as well as women in your work? Um, I meant by that was that um, because I was the victim, because I was the abuser, I could see her, my daughter's behavior. I could see his behavior and I knew what it was, you know, and I stopped and, and told my daughter, look, he will kill you. You know, if he has a gun, he will use it on you. And she said, no, ma, it's, he would not do that. She trusted him. And I knew he would kill her. Everybody else, including him, was so shocked. But I, I'm, I wasn't shocked, and I'm still not shocked. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, to the second part of the question, is this is why men need to be included in the conversation because we go all it, we do all this advocacy, advocacy stuff. We have all these programs. But nobody talks to men and boys about domestic violence and mental health. And it's ridiculous. On the level of some of these platforms, nobody grabs a group of boys and say, let's talk about domestic violence. Mm -hmm. this, this is why we must talk to men and boys. We're not going to break the cycle, only talking to women that are victims of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And I want just, we just have a minute or so left for this portion because we need to open up to the Q&A, but I wanna give you a chance to talk about some of the communication tools that you've developed. So, you, you know, when you say where's many tags, you've got five that you've developed. What is, just briefly, can you describe what those are? So verbal abuse, of course, our communication level at the dinner table. Emotional abuse is going to follow that. Those are the first two tags that abusers really use to entrap victims. Then of course we have financial abuse, which is a tag that a lot of these programs do not discuss being a part of domestic violence. And of course there's sexual abuse. Sexual abuse is happening in the household a lot of times. Um, and then of course it's physical abuse. Physical abuse is last because I was the abuser. I didn't have to hit you. I didn't have to put my hands on you to make you a victim of domestic violence. But we tell people, show me your marks. Mm -hmm. So the marks of, is, is what we're waiting on to, to say that this person is, is a victim of domestic violence. And that's not so. A lot of times in domestic violence, verbal and emotional abuse, financial abuse. These three tags do not have visible marks. Mm -hmm. We can't see these. So, you know, we... We, we educate on all five of those tags because those are the primary ways that abusers entrap and get and keep victims. Right, okay. I think that's a powerful place to end. And I really wanna thank you, Queen and Betsy and Kate and Kenny for being so generous with your time tonight and being patient as well, because I know it's been a long night. So we're gonna open it up to the Q and A and I'm gonna let Carlin take over for that. Yes, thank you, Holly. Um, I'm now on my phone because my computer disappeared on me. So um, I can't see all of you at once, but if you want to ask a question out loud, please feel free to unmute and, and do so or to put it in the chat and I will keep an eye on that and read questions out. Holly, go ahead. I also want to remind people that if they want to um, let us know, you know what brings them here tonight and if they've also had, a, if they've been directly impacted by gun violence in their own lives. 
Yes, thank you. Mostly gratitude in the chat so far. Um, thank you all for, for sharing your stories and your time with us this evening to, to be together. Um, Rochelle has a question um, and then Finn, thank you Kay for, for the hand. Um, Rochelle asks, what legislation is in the works right now to change things? Who, who is that for? <laughs> is that for me? Maybe, maybe for the group. Yeah, Holly, if you okay. want to start it off, then if, uh -oh. if anyone wants to um, chime in. You know, that is a tough question to answer because, you know, on the federal level, really nothing's moving as far as I've heard. Um, and, you know, Kenny, you might be more aware, Betsy, Kate, Queen, let me know, you know, if that's not true. I think, to be honest, uh, most of the work that I'm aware of is being done on the state level. And that's really, um, you know, on a state by state basis. So on the one hand, there has been some work, work done that's really good in the last several years, like the red flag laws, the ERPOs um, that are definitely helping to save lives. So if you're interested, I would look up ERPO or red flag laws. Um, at the same time, you know, I showed you the 2020 statistics, you know, the, the murder rate is going through the roof and so are the sales. Um, so it just makes me wonder, you know, how effective are we really being, you know, in terms of state level legislation. Um, but I, I don't want to say more than that because it's really particular. There are a lot of different details and it's on a state by state basis, but welcome to open it up to the group. Would you like to say, Holly? Go ahead. Any state, any state or any country, it will not regulate the sale and the use of assault weapons that you, you don't go hunting with assault weapons. You don't, you don't shoot deer with assault weapons. Mm -hmm. The only thing they're used for is killing people. And if you can't enact legislation against that, then, then, then there's really something really wrong. I agree. <sighs> you know what? There's somebody in the chat, Poe Murray, and she's it's gonna be great. She wants to give a quick update on the federal efforts. Poe, you wanna speak up? And then Rachel Joseph after her. Hi, everyone. So um, my name is Poe Murray. Um, I'm actually from Sandy Hook. I'm currently in uh, Orlando, um, but I lead the Newtown Action Alliance. And we've been working on the federal legislative efforts. And I wanted to let everyone know that um, there are efforts to pass federal legislation um, during the last Congress, during the 116th Congress, to bills passed out of the House of Representatives for the first time since the Sandy Hook tragedy. Those two bills were the um, HR 8, which is the Universal Background Check Bill, and HR 1112, which was to close the Charleston loophole. It actually doesn't close it completely, but extends a time period to give the FBI time to do background checks. Um, but since Joe Biden has been elected, um, he had ran on the most progressive gun violence prevention agenda. And um, we're pushing him really hard, you know, thanks to the survivors um, that are on this, uh, on this call uh, to push him to uh, pass executive actions that he can do like immediately, like within the 100 days. And then there are a lot of bills being reintroduced. We've been playing offense against the NRA for um, last eight years now. And uh, the assault weapons ban bill is being introduced uh, most likely next week or reintroduced. And um, the, the George Floyd Policing Act um, is being introduced. Also um, like ghost gun bans and um, many other legislative efforts are being reintroduced. So we are playing offense um, in the House of Representatives. We'll likely be able to pass a background check and hopefully the assault weapons ban and other bills as well. But with a 50-50 tie in, in, the, in the Senate with some very conservative Democrats yeah. like Joe Biden and Cinema, it might be really challenging to you know, pass an assault weapons ban. But that's why we support ending the filibuster so that we can pass those um, gun laws that we need. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And you're right. The filibuster is absolutely paramount in this discussion. And I'm just going to put it out there for Queen and Kenny and and meets DC statehood is really important for any progressive cause that you can think of. It's just right anyway, it's the right thing to do. 
but it's very strange not to have congressional representation. So putting it out there for all the progressive causes. So Rachel, I think Rachel Joseph is here from Minneapolis, if I'm not mistaken, I saw her in the chat. Rachel, are you here? She actually told me she had to drop off. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, she had said Survivors Lead is supporting the Resources for Victims of Gun Violence Act, which would establish an expert committee to, identi to identify gaps in direct services. This should be survivor led and centered. So I'm glad that she wrote that in there so we could get that in there. May I say something about that, Holly, right quick? Sure. I forgot to mention. As you very well know, you and I have talked about it. With Bloomberg in New York, mm -hmm. uh, as far as I know, that committee that he comprised did not have one black person. And I tried very hard. I tried to the president, you introduced me to the president of Mother's Day and Action. Mm -hmm. And I tried to her and I never heard any response back. How are you gonna have a gun violence commission that doesn't have any black people on it? And it's not even talking about black people being murdered. That's a farce. Mm -hmm. I agree. Absolutely agree. I think that's super important and that really needs to be talked about and addressed much, much more. We're never going to get to the bottom of this. So look, I mean, everybody has stayed and I really appreciate it. I can stay for as long as anybody wants to talk. I want to give uh, our guests the possibility of, you know, logging off and maybe having dinner and taking care of the kids. <laughs> I mean, I, I understand you're all busy with other things. So I so appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. I'll be in contact. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. All right. Bye, Queen, bye, Kate. Betsy, are you leaving too? Bye. Betsy, did you have one last thing you wanted to say? Yes. Betsy. There yeah. is one last thing I'd like to say, and I want to reiterate uh, <clears throat> the importance of this project, Holly, uh, and to all the survivors here, is that when we tell our stories, and the book I wrote, uh, Immunity from Justice, Pat's Story, it's a very raw book. Holly has it. She, she read it. It's a very raw book. But when we tell our stories, we don't need to uh, water them down. We need to give the gut feeling and the pain so people will squirm. And, then, and I had a friend that read my book, <clears throat> and she was a big Second Amendment, let's go out in the woods and shoot anything, and you know, hated anybody that said they're coming to get your guns and all this, which is a constant constant reiteration on certain party members of a certain party. But um, <clears throat> um, when we tell our stories, we need to let it out there to make people squirm, to make people touch their eyes where their eyes are going to water and feel uncomfortable. Because if you haven't had it work, if you haven't had it happen to you, then you don't, you, you don't have that guttural, visceral <clears throat> pain that the only way it can be described is if you go through it. Um, so there is a reason why when we tell our stories, we tell them so raw because people need to understand this is not going away. It's getting worse. And, uh, but there can be something uh, that can be done about it, but people need to understand we're, they're not coming to get your guns. We're just trying to save lives. But there's a reason that we tell our stories in such a visceral way is to move the reader or move the listener. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. And um, if anybody wants, if anybody would like my book, I'd be happy to send them a copy. I have them here at my house. And that will be archived as well in Colum at the Columbia Archives with your, with your interview, so. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else, any questions? There was one in the chat, Holly, about the role, um, I think it was from Valerie, the role of media in mm. gun violence and in this movement and in sort of stories and representations, I think connected really to what Betsy was describing, but maybe on the, the opposite end, like the over sensationalizing and, and spectacle and then the desensitizing maybe, I think. Yeah, I mean, the media, that this is such an important question and in different areas. So as Kenny said, uh, which is very true, mostly the way that we hear about gun violence is through these horrific mass shootings. Of course they're horrific. We know this. 
They only represent, however, 4% of all shootings in the United States. And they're also really a white problem. It's a white issue. It's a really strange pathology, but it's a white problem, okay? It's not addressing the majority of the problem, um, which is everything else, the domestic violence and, and the suicide and every single thing else. Um, so that's the first thing. In recent years, I have read some stories. There's one, I don't have it at my fingertips. It was a really good article and it was after, yes, a mass shooting, the one in Oregon in Umqua. Um, uh, and, it, and it actually, what happened was the journalist stayed with one of the people who had been shot, who was massively injured and talked about, you know, the, the media is gone and now, you know, her, you know, her life is beginning in this, in this altered state. And so in that sense, I thought it was really good because it was compassionate and it was more meaningful and deeper than almost anything I had read. Having said that, it's rare, you know, and I'm not sure that it's enough. Um, I was actually at a symposium a year ago 2019, fall 2019 in Philadelphia for journalists reporting on gun violence. And it was called the Better Gun Violence Reporting Summit. And so there are efforts being made. And one of the things being discussed was the idea that maybe it's a good idea not to report on the everyday violence if it's just a sentence or two, because it just creates this kind of sensationalistic feeling. So, you know, do we need to know that there was a murder on corner X every time that it happens? And it's a strange way of, kind of trying to re figure your mind because, you know, don't we need to know that? But perhaps we don't because it's actually adding to the problem. That's what people talked about there. Kenny, go ahead. I would, I would definitely like to address that. Okay. When my son was murdered, a perfect example of media coverage. My son was murdered on 11th and U Street in Northwest Washington. And that was decimated by the riots. And so it hadn't been, a, it hadn't began its recovery then when my son was murdered. And, I, and at that time when my son was murdered, there were black kids being murdered all the time in DC. Right. Not much knowledge, not much, not much information, no news coverage. The same time period when my son was murdered, a Georgetown stunt shop owner got murdered for the same time. Not only did this make, not only did this murder make local news, it made CNN. Never mention of my son who also was a store owner. So when anybody tells me, let's cover the mass murders and not the other murders, and that's what you're telling me is that you're not considering, you're not even thinking about the impact that these murders are having on the black community. They're happening every day. So let's not discuss those like black people killing black people. That's what that says to me. But well, let's cover when a white man kills a whole lot of white people. Yeah, let's cover that. And I think that's ridiculous. Yeah, that being a black man. Go ahead. I said, being a black person who sits back and the murder rate, you want to question this about different today. The murder rate is going back up in DC. It's not going down. Yeah. So it means that something's not being done right. If, if, we, if, if we say it and give you the answers and you don't want to go by the answer, something's not being done right. And so to, to, so to dis, dismiss black people being murdered because that's what this person, whoever's making this conversation, that's what they're talking about. Because white people don't generally get murdered on street corners. Not generally. That's not that's not what happens. Black people, that happens to every day in black, every state in the union. A uh, black person is getting killed on street corners. What we need to do is we need to discuss more about this impact of gun violence in the black community. Because if you don't do that, you'll never have a true story about true gun violence in America. And I just wanna put these things together. Of course, I absolutely 100% agree. So when I mention that maybe a couple of lines in a newspaper, and this is not my idea, it's theirs, but I sort of agree, you know, so it's not necessary to report just a couple of lines in a newspaper. The part that I agree with is what that is, is a number. And so it's kind of playing into this problem that you're describing, Kenny. If you want to then give the square inches in the newspaper uh, to you know every single person who's affected, the victims, and really discuss their lives, then yes, more media, not less. So it's a tricky situation, 
But I 100% agree with Kenny that um, the way that things are portrayed, I mean, and Kenny, if you know his story, you know that he has had to fight every step of the way, you know, so there's, yeah. there's a murder, a murderer here. Um, I don't know when years ago, a woman, a young woman's body was found in the in the park here, the Rock Creek Park. Her remains were found a year after she went missing and it was all over the news and yeah. Kenny had to fight back and say, of course, her life matters, but don't our lives matter? Don't our families matter as much as this one story, one story versus dozens? And then we couldn't, Holly, and the victims back then, and the reason why I said that, because those of us who have been impacted by gun violence, we couldn't even get a call back from a homicide detective. And I said this, if you remember, you all, you all may know this guy, uh, Chief Rams, he was Chief Rams, he's all over the news. I said this to him, if you want to get out there and you want to console uh, Sharon Levy, I think her name was Levy, her family, you're on the news all the time doing it. Our families are about just as much size, and we can't even get a return call from a homicide detective. Right, and so that's the point too. So it's all linked. So the media attention is linked with, you know, not getting a call back from the homicide department in your own city, politicians ignoring you, the gun violence prevention community, the white gun violence prevention community, maybe not calling you back either. That's why Kenny has said he feels left out of the conversation in spite of all the experience that he has. So, yes. you know, if you take away anything from tonight, I hope that you take a lot of whoever's left here, some things, you know, this is one major, major, major issue, okay? Um, and I also think that, you know, all the stories here tonight have a lot of overlapping themes. The lack of accountability and the system failures for sure are paramount for me. Absolutely. Holly, thank you so much. And Betsy, Kate, um, Kenny, um, I just, and Queen, are you still here? I can't, I can't see if, as well. They Queen has headed crazy. off. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you all so much for sharing your evenings with us, with, with your evenings with us and your experiences. And, and thank you all um, for sticking around as well. Um, folks who are still here very likely will be super interested in the event in two weeks as well, um, which is uh, parallel. Absolutely. Um, Gabriel Solis will be talking about his experience with the Texas After Violence Project. Um, the event is on March 11th and it's called Documenting State Violence, Building Archives of Survival. Um, so very much in conversation with, with this event and we hope to see you all there. Um, and thank you again so much, um, Holly, for this work and, and for you all for sharing your stories and your time with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you for having me. Thanks, Betsy. Talk to you soon. Bye.